Uh, normally we do these as a questionnaire, but you've got your history written out, so no, the floor is yours, sir. It's better in my memory. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is a story of PSE Thomas T. Parrott, 3143-4488, starting December 7th, 1941. I was born July 9th, 1925, in Malden, Mass. On December 7th, 1941, I was going to high school in my hometown of Saugus, Mass, which I had lived in since I was one year old. On December 7th, 1941, I was only 16 years old. At that time, I was a patrol leader in the Eagle Patrol in Troop 64 Boy Scouts. We did our civil defense duty by being messages on our bikes in blackouts. My post was in a school two miles from my home and on the other side of Saugus. When I was 17 and a half years old, I joined the Civilian Air Reserve where we met twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. We had uniforms with Air Force pins. Wednesday we had Morse code radio and air navigation. Sundays we learned how to fly and use air navigation. When I was 18 I signed up for the draft while still in school. June 23, 1943 my left eye was injured when I was hit in the left eye by a spring and bolt from a rifle. My father drove me to the eye and ear hospital in Boston where they were able to save my eye. The young fella in bed next to me tripped over a chair in a blackout, broke his glasses, they cut the optic nerve to his left eye. Even though his eye wasn't cut, he ended up with a glass eye because the optic nerve was cut. They put drops in my eye for several days. Then the doctor put a light to my left eye. I told him I could see a light far off. He said it was a good sign. After two weeks in the hospital, they sent me home, but had to put drops in my eye for months. Went to the Boston Hospital once a month for tests. Each time my eye showed improvement, I had to give up the civilian air reserve and my flying, as you had to have 20-20 vision in both eyes. I decided to pass on the knowledge I learned in the civilian air reserve to young boys who wanted to fly, so I became an Air Scout leader in Troop 64, while Captain Parker was the leader in Boy Scouts in Troop 64. Most of the Air Scouts went into the U.S. Air Force when they were old enough to enlist. While in last year of high school, I was called up in the draft, but my eye was still healing, so I was classified 4F twice. This let me graduate from high school. The doctor in Boston told me I had a horseshoe tear in the back of the eye that had healed to a fine line. I had a non-progressive cataract, but each day my sight would get better. After I graduated from high school, I went to work for GE Company for a month. When I got my third draft card as A1, my bad eye had healed to 2025, which the Army would accept. Went to the draft board and told them I was 1A and wanted to go to Fort Devens in the first group, which ended up being is. 15th of August, 1944. At Fort Devens, they gave us a test on Morse code. We were supposed to put down the dit dit tars, but I put down the correct letter. Captain called me into his office and asked me why I had put down the letters instead of the dit dit tars. I told him uh, 
I knew Morse code. He studied my words, then said, Son, you are right. It does spell right. He said he was sending me to radio school in Alabama. When I got to Alabama, they told me the radio school was closed two weeks ago and that it was all infantry school. Now, so I went through infantry school, graduated, and went home to leave. I think it was five days as the Battle of the Boats was going on, and they needed us bad. Had to report back December 26th. I had to leave Christmas Day at 1 p.m. A funny thing happened to me while going through our final training. One day in the rain, the general singled me out to show the rest of the troops how to jump out onto a rope and swing across the river. I had done it beautifully the first time, as the rope wasn't slippery. The time I jumped out, caught the rope and slid down the rope and landed on my back in the mud on the other side of the river. The general then said, uh, I guess the rope is too slippery, but see how he jumped out and grabbed the rope and swung across. Boy, did I get teased by my buddies. I shipped out January 8, 1945 on the Queen Elizabeth and January 18th was at the front in France. In December 1944, while waiting for transportation overseas, I pulled one day of guard duty at the tomb of the unknown soldier and one day guard duty on the White House steps. Now, when you pull one tour of duty garden, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, you're entitled to wear a black tie for the rest of your army life. But I sent it home. I didn't want to wear a black tie and single me out. I shipped overseas January 8, 1945, on the Queen Elizabeth with two of my buddies from my hometown, Saugus, Mass. Their names were Al Duncan and Al Dunham. We were separated at the replacement depot, each going to a different outfit. I was very lucky and was assigned to Company C First Squad, which later on I found out it was really the third squad. But we all considered we were first squad, so. Uh, uh, 66 Armored Infantry Battalion, 12th Armored Division as a 30 caliber water-cooled machine gunner. 21 of us were assigned to seven boxes of records for all of the soldiers on the Queen Elizabeth. Three men to a box, one man for each box around the clock at all times. We 21 men had a beautiful cabin on a deck so if the ship was hit, we could get off with the records. And we were told not to survive if we didn't have that record. But we had special duty, and the captain took us all over the complete ship in daylight, and then again when it was dark, so we could find our way around. At that time, I found out that the ship had looked like two tunnels, uh, steam, mm -hmm. steam chimneys. But actually there was three. There was two in one and one in another one. So that was to deceive the enemy. <coughs> uh, the meals were twice a day, breakfast and supper. They had three shifts for each meal. They had three colored buttons for the shifts, and you were supposed to eat when your color came up, but we ended up eating four times a day because we had all three colors in the cabin. You know, <coughs> we 
who was sailing the cross all alone and not in a convoy. The Queen Elizabeth was too fast for a convoy and depended on her speed and zigzag the course to cross in five days. On midnight the third day out of New York, I was having a cup of coffee in the kitchen when the ship lurched and shuddered. The coffee pot almost slid off the table. The next day the captain told the 21 of us to be real alert as he had caught a sub on the surface the night before and had rammed it and sunk it before it could submerge. Now, he didn't know if it was American or German, but he wasn't taking a chance. January 14th, landed in Glasgow, Scotland, overnight by tram to Southampton, England, marched five miles to a ship, next day sailed to La Havre, France. We were the first troops to use a floating deck January 18th, 1945, to land in La Havre, France. It was raining, muddy, and a bad picture to start. For a mile in any direction, there wasn't a building or tree standing. And it really looked eerie. We wanted all of us. What are we headed for? <laughs> we went by truck to a replacement depot and then to a train to our next replacement depot. Sixty-eight of us went by truck to the 12th Armored Division, where we arrived on January 27th as reinforcements at Middlehausen Bergen. Eight of us went to 3rd Squad, 1st Platoon, Company C, 66 Armored Infantry Battalion, 12th Armored Division. There were only four men left in the 3rd squad, uh, squad after Steinwall. January 16, 1945. These men were Staff Sergeant Donald N. Hurley, our squad leader, Sergeant Richard A. Brock, Assistant Squad Leader, T-5 John R. Higgins, driver of our half-track, and Russell Scott, Scott. These were the, the old timers of my squad. On January 27, 1945, eight new men were assigned to this third squad, 1st Platoon, Company C, 66 Armored Infantry Battalion. These men were Thomas T. Parrott, 3143-4488, machine gunner, Robert Double Christian, 369-8354, Gordon C. Albertson, 375-99575. Benjamin S. Peresi, 421-36250. Aubrey L. Long, 364-68924. Alvin Brockaway, 421-36955. Emmett B. Killingsworth, Three seven seven four nine eight zero oh, five. John G. Klotzaritz. These twelve men all signed their names February ninth, nineteen forty five, in a pair of wooden shoes, sables. After the Coma Pocket Battle, on January twenty eighth, nineteen forty five, we were issued different weapons if we desired. I was offered a pistol if I desired, as I was a machine gunner, but I kept my M1 instead, which I wore on the back. If I carried the uh, 30 caliber machine, what a cool gun. When we went into battle on foot, mostly we left the machine gun in the half track, so I was glad to carry the M1. On January 27th, our Company C Commander, First Lieutenant Ogen R. Fox, welcomed the eight of us new men and introduced us to our squad leader of the First Squad, uh, Third Squad, First Platoon, Staff Sergeant Donald M. Early, and his Assistant Squad Leader, Sergeant Richard A. Brock. 
At that time, he assigned me to be the machine gunner for the squad. First Lieutenant Ogen at R. Fox <coughs> did not have a platoon leader yet for the, for the first platoon, so that was why he had to do the in introduction. We get a new second lieutenant for our first platoon a few days later, but he did not last long, and I forgot his name. I remember about him that he was a very nice man. We all liked him. On January 29th, they took us out in the half tracks on some lonely road to practice loading and loading, unloading and shooting the machine gun from the half track. My squad leader, Donald Hurley, had a grenade in his right pocket. When he dismounted for the first time, he felt like something was tight in the pocket. What happened was the pin had come loose and the handle was half extended. When he removed the grenade from his pocket, the handle flew off and the four and a half seconds time was started. Don looked around and saw soldiers all around him, but there was a deep ditch on both sides of the road. So Don yelled, grenade, hit the ditch then threw the grenade on the street, or rather, he hit a tree with it that bounced back at his feet. Everyone was in the ditch, thanks to Dawn, so no one was hit. After that, Dawn made all of us bend the pins on all our grenades. On February 3rd, we moved out to attack Coma. We arrived at Coma outskirts early in the morning and a half-track took up a position in the field next to the woods. Just at daylight, I noticed from my gun tournament that I had been manning all night a large rabbit. Don told me to climb down and let my assistant gunner take over for a while. Just as I got down and before my buddy could take over, a German threw two grenades at us. One landed by our right front tire that gave us a flat, and the other on front hood. Luckily for us, we had the armor shield over the front glass. T5 John R. Higgins, Donald M. Hurley, and myself were showered with broken glass, but none of us were injured. We were lucky. We never saw the German as he ran as soon as he threw the two grenades. We were told to dismount, fix bayonets, and attack a hill close by while on our half-track driver had the task of replacing our right front flat tire. At 5.15 a.m., we were in the woods on top of the hill outside of Coma. I started digging three machine gun holes, but each time I had it dug about two inches deep, they made us move forward. We could hear the church bells ringing, so we knew the Germans were aware that we were close. We entered the town and saw dead Germans on the roadside. The FFI had beat us to these fellows. We made our way through the town until we came to a church that had a sniper in it. As we were going up the street, a French Moroccan squad leader was coming down the street with his squad. The sniper tried to run to us, but the first French Moroccan got him with a burst of machine gun bullets. The bullets were flying all around us, <laughs> but he got, he got the fellow. And I looked at him as I walked by him. He was dead. After getting to center of the, the center of the town, we put up in a hotel for a few days. On February 9th, just before noon, we were told to mount up for a patrol in the Vogue's Mountains. We were to be the point. Now they broke our squad in half. Uh, Dick Brock took a half, did a parade, 
and the other half of us went on patrol in the half tracks. We had a tank in front of us as leader, and we were the first half track going down one mountain road. We lost our left track with a bang. Thought we were hit for a minute due to the great skill of our half track driver, John R. Higgins. He was able to bring us to a stop after a first after a shot delay, but we were doing like S's all the way down till he could stop. But he was a wonderful driver. The lead tank in front of us was hit by an 88. <clears throat> it was turning on a curve. All on board were killed. Our driver told us to hang on as he was going to turn us on our side, on the right-hand side of the road. And as he tipped us over, I kind of shimmied over on the side, and I ended up sitting on the side of the machine gun rack. But we had lost all the booze that we had on the half track. We had about three or four cases of everything Snops, champagne, everything. It smelled like a brewery afterwards. Uh, but after we were on our side, the tank behind us shot the 88. There was nobody in it. They had already just fired the one shot and took off. But where I was, my machine gun was on the right hand side of the half track. I couldn't see the 88. My driver could see it, and that's why he tipped us over. But they knocked out the gun anyways. Uh, they pushed the knocked out tank off the mountainside. I often wondered if they ever found the, the tank or the fellows that were still in it, because they just got it out of the way, tipped us up right again, and we become the lead vehicle all the way down. I, th I think we ended up in the vicinity of Valcomont. We were showered with apples and wine. We set up an outpost at the end of town and put our patrols in the hills for prisoners. And while we were stopped at the furthest point, we had a German about a mile away running down to us. And we shot machine gun bullets over his head to keep him running, and he, he never stopped that whole mile until he got past us. And I, I looked in the uh, basket of apples that they passed up, and there was one rotten apple in there. And as the chairman ran by, I, being a young fella, I took the rotten apple and I hit him in the back of the head. <laughs> but he never made it. Never jumped or anything else, he just kept on running with his hands up. And we took quite a few prisoners. Oh, I guess he ran two miles. But I mean, he never stopped. He just kept running and running and running. On February 8th, we did a victory parade review for General de Gaulle in Colma. I was the second man de Gaulle stood in front of and saluted. I was fourth in line in the first row, and he turned and saluted every fourth man. He looked real sharp and ex exercised this maneuver, very sharp. On February 12th, we returned to Lowville by way over the Vogue's mountains for the rest and for rest and maneuvers and inspection. Me and a few fellows had to dig a few six by six by four holes as we never had our gas masks. We used to keep our socks and smokes and candy and stuff in them. Good gas masks didn't work anyway, so we weren't carrying an extra. We'd rather do the punishment. I never found one that worked.
John ran a wire from our half track to our second floor of our sleeping quarters, so we had a a lot of light at night. We had a table and a stove in our room. We slept in our bedrolls on the floor at night, played cards, pinnacle, most of the time while we were here. I got a one-day pass to Nancy in a cold shower. While we were here at Longville, also all the men in my squad signed a pair of wooden shoes, sables, dated February 9, 1945 which I mailed home at that time and still have, although they are now in the museum. Mm. On March 2nd, we were ordered to mount up to go on attack against Forbeck. On the way to Forbeck, the convoy was stopped at a two-mile open space that had pillboxes covering this open space of field and road and that we had to cross. Uh, Lieutenant R. Fox, our company commander, singled me out to ride on a light tank as machine gunner to check the, the pillboxes out because they weren't sure if they were manned or not. And going across this open field, we kept running over anti uh, and uh, anti personnel mines. The, ha the tank would jump up and down. And one of them, my helmet come off, and the lieutenant says, hang on tight, he says, because we're going to go through this tank trap, which was a great big deep ditch. And I says, well, stop the tank for a minute, I'll run, run back and get my helmet. And he says, son, you ain't getting off this tank. He says, it's all landmines we're going through. He says, we got plenty of helmets when we get back. So he says, hang on tight. He says, we're going through full speed. But he says, don't pull that trigger. Because he says, all those guys back there, the minute you fire one shot, they're going to all open up and we're in the path. So we went down through that tank trap. And I don't know how that driver ever kept control because I ended up, I thought he was holding on tight. But I ended up going around and around, and I ended up sitting on the lieutenant's head with my feet and hands sticking out of that hole that he was, you know, standing in. And he's underneath me trying to push me up. He says, is your back broke? I says, no. I says, I'm all right. I'm just embarrassed. But when I looked up, the tank had the cannon sticking in the hole of the first uh, pillar box. So thank God there was nobody in it. So then we went the whole length of all the, you know, checking all the pillboxes out, and every one of them was empty, whether they went out the back door or what, but nobody fired a shot. Get back, I got a new helmet, we continued on. Uh, I said, we found all the pillboxes empty, so we returned to our column and continue, continued to fall back. Up to now, it would have been easy. We went into fall back as veterans. Now our spirits were very high. We added a new man to our squad just a few days ago. His last name was Bullets. We dismounted in the field just outside of fall back. This time they told me to take the machine gun with me. My squad was less than a hundred yards from my half track when it was hit by an 88 shell. It hit the 90 octane gas tanks that the fellows used for backrests when en route. The half track went up in flames. The only thing that T5 John Higgins, a half track driver, could save was my musette bag that was hanging on the door near the gun ring. It was on fire, but John put the fire out and saved it for me. I sent it home with some of my souvenirs. Uh, I gave this to the museum, and you can see where it had been on fire. My squad all lost our wallets and money and valuables that we had in there. We just get paid 
for the first time in a couple of months. So we lost all our money. Because the strong box we kept it in was just a little bit too far in there. He just, it was too hot, he couldn't get it. Yeah, all he could reach was my music bag. And all I had in that was socks and other things and cigars and tobacco. As we went in the street, some fellow was taking movies of us. I never did see any of the movies, but they got us walking in column going into Fourback. And it was a funny thing, but they had a sign. Uh, Red machine gun in the street. I never saw it, but I was told afterwards that the sign was there. So I ended up walking down the left side and the right side and the middle. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Right, let's see, right after I, I rounded a corner and all hell let loose, it was the worst mortar and shell fire I ever saw. There was a shell exploding every second, both sides of the street. I was knocked down from a shell that hit the wall to my left. It felt like someone hit me with a sledgehammer. The man in front of me was hit by the same shell. I sat on the ground and thought where I was hit in the side I had a belly wound. Watched the man in front of me get up, holding a bloody handkerchief to his jaw. Just decided to stand up myself and felt for blood on my side, but I was scared to look down. To my surprise, I found I had been hit in my cartridge belt. One of my clips of bullets had a one-inch long deep dent across all four of the outer bullets and that it acted like a, an armor suit. I wish I'd kept it for a souvenir but at the time I figured they were no good bent so I took them out and threw them on the ground. Two men on the right side of the road had been hit in the legs by the same shell. I decided to walk on the right side of the road and crossed over only to be knocked down again. This time a piece of shrapnel hit my right upraised foot and spun me around until I, I fell. It put a one quarter inch cut and a double layer of leather in my shoe. It cut my sock, I had a, a quarter inch cut on the sock and never cut my foot. So, I mean, somebody at that point, I think, was looking out for me. I, I found this out later when I was able to take my boot off. But at the time, I, you know, I was all right. I just get up and kept going. Get up and decide to walk down the middle of the street because, like I say, I didn't see the sign saying it was a machine gun at the end of the road. And I thought it was safer in the middle, it was on the two sides. So our first sergeant blew his whistle and called us all into a building on the right. He gave me help for walking down the middle. He said, didn't you see the sign back there, machine gun? And just as he said that, the machine gun opened up on two men carrying a stretcher and killed the guys that were because he figured he had nobody else, so they took that out. But we went inside, and I was on the first floor. They had wooden shutters over it, and I'm leaning up against the wall. A piece of shrapnel comes through the, the wooden uh, window coverings. He hit the wall like a sledgehammer, and it went bang, 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 bang. It kept hitting from one wall to the other, and each time it hit a wall, I'd sink lower. When I finally ended up sitting with just my head up, the thing landed right over my head in the wall. <laughs> so after that, we went down cellar, 
And when I'm standing in, uh, on the floor and all of a sudden somebody knocked on the bottom of my feet. Those two kids would crawl from one building to the other. They had a tunnel from one building to the next building. And so I get off of it and the two kids come up through the floor. And then Donald Hurley talked to the Germans. They had cooked the potato soup. And he talked us all into giving us, uh, giving over our uh, rations that we had to the Germans. And they gave us potato soup. And it was delicious. I've always loved potato soup after that. Okay, that, that night, I think it was uh, Second Lieutenant Ansel E. Huggenen took our first platoon on a hike to put up an outpost. After a half hour walk in the dark, taking different streets, left and right, I think we got lost. My, my third squad was point with the lieutenant leading. We were just turning a right corner when Ansel stopped us. There was a German patrol marching straight for us. We opened fire on them and they jumped for cover. The lieutenant told my uh, third squad to stay there for 10 minutes and give them time to get the rest of the platoon back to our own lines. After 10 minutes, uh, Staff Sergeant Hurley and Sergeant Brock decided to take a short cut back to our lines. We went to the left. It had not gone too far when we were jumped by Germans. One bullet was fired from a machine gun and then it must have jammed. The bullet went between the point man and myself. It made a big spark on the brick building to our left. We all hit the dirt fast, and next minute the machine gun started raking us with fire. I was laying on the right side of some cement steps, and the point man was on the exposed side of the stairs. Why he wasn't killed, I will never know. I had my water cool machine gun stuck out in front of me uh, for protection. My head was just even with the bottom step. I put my right hand on my helmet as it was coming off. And the bullet ricocheted off the steps and nicked the fourth finger of my right hand at the second knuckle. After we get out of there, the point man showed me where he had been nicked on the right cheek. And I showed him my hand. We both thought how lucky we had been. Uh, minor flesh wounds, which we just covered with a band-aid. So that was nothing compared to what, you know, we weren't going to get no purple hat for that. We didn't want one. Not when the other fellows were losing legs and getting hit bad. And while I was laying there, one of the Germans threw a potato masher at me. It landed six feet in front of me. I could not get up to get it as the machine gun bullets were flying over my head. Uh, I was waiting for the grenade to go off. I had a flashback after I counted to 16. Grenades go off before four. And I got up to 16. I said, something's wrong. You know, I'm counting too fast. <laughs> I remember... But I remember at that time I had a flashback. This girl had told me she was in my class and she wouldn't tell me her name. And at that point I did remember her name. Her name was Peggy Foster. And I never forgot it after that, but that was a flashback I had. Oh, that was Peggy Foster. And 45 years later I remembered it. I can still remember it and have 
not seen her since to tell her I remember her name. Richard A. Brock saved our lives when he silenced the machine gun with rifle fire while he told us to crawl to the side of the building with the rest of the squad. I told him I thought the machine gun had been hit as I smelled press stone. They told me to leave it and join them at the eight-foot-high barbed wire fence at the back of the building. We climbed a tree to get over the uh, barbed wire and get back to our outfit without any more trouble. The next day when we attacked it, someone picked up the machine gun. It had not been damaged. They said they were a potato potato masher about six feet away in front of it. He looked at the potato masher and he found out that somebody had cut the string halfway. So when the German pulled the string, it broke and didn't, and didn't set it off. Otherwise, I would have been killed. And that's why it never, never went off. So somebody saved my life at that point. I was living a charmed life. <coughs> the next day we moved up to the railroad tracks. They even tried screaming memes to stop us. Just after I watched the chairman run across the tracks to surrender, we all ran across the tracks, except for Tex. He picked up a five-gallon water can and just walked across. He wasn't scared of nothing. He was quite a guy. The rest of us all ran. <laughs> One man was killed crossing these tracks. He was hit by a brip gun. They got the chairman before he could get away. We held five houses out of 15 that were spaced like a horseshoe with woods all around and a hundred yards of track at our back. Uh, we held the first house on the corner, on the left hand side by the woods. We held it for five days and nights. There was a coal mine surrounded by a high stone wall and we had uh, trailblazers come in and that was the regular infantry. They bypassed us and they went through the woods and the woods was full of shoe mines. And one guy stepped on a shoe mine and when he fell there was another shoe mine right in the crutch. He just missed set that one off. And I guess they sent out a tank to pick up the survivors because they got as far as the wall and then they all ran back and came in our buildings that we held. Uh, like I said, we had five houses and we had a man to every woman, uh, to every window on the second floor. And we had to stay awake for five days and five nights just keeping the Germans at bay. At night they'd be walking underneath us one night, a German patrol walked right under my window. I threw two grenades out the window. They both went off. I didn't get anybody. They got around the side of the building. And, uh, oh yeah, Richard Brock had to take over my machine gun as punishment for leaving the machine gun behind because he's the one that told me to leave it. And the lieutenant figured he'd get even with him and make him sit up the machine gun at another window. So I ended up, they gave me a bazooka with one shell. And they says, you get that tank if it pokes its head out. But remember, you only get one shell and that's all we got is the one shell. So I was just hoping that that didn't show up and it never come out. But that tank had gone back and forth in the air and they were uh, picking up the wounded guys and carrying them back. Years later, uh, I ran into a fellow in the bar room, a German, that had come to this country. And I was telling him, oh, I know that. He says, I was one of the Germans that was in that cave. 
He says, you know, when they sent the planes over the bomb, he says, they buried me in the tunnel. He says, it took me a couple of days to dig my way back out of the tunnel. That's why that when we get done, uh, nobody fired a shot at us when we walked out of there. But, but the planes, when they come over, they made a complete circle. The first, there was two great big towers. There was a steel tower and a wooden and a, uh, a brick tower. <coughs> and they had machine guns in it. <coughs> the first plane that came over and dropped the bomb, they shot it down. He never pulled out of the dive. But when the bomb went off, the first bomb took both towers down. Now, the day before that, I counted uh, three shell hits on one of the towers and five on the other one, and it didn't do nothing to them. But one bomb took them both down. But they, it was funny how they didn't, they come in right in, drop one bomb at a time, and when the other plane was going up, the next one was coming down, and they bombed it so much that they closed all the tunnels that the Scream of Mimi's were in. So uh, we were able to get up and walk out. But before that, when the, when the trailblazers were going into the woods, I saw a mortar shell hit on the top of uh, where they were walking. And it didn't hit anybody that was near him, but it knocked down a guy about 50 yards away crossing the stream going in the woods. So uh, you never know what the shrapnel, what it's going to do. It's going to miss you. It could land beside you or, or it could hit somebody about 50 yards away. But uh, it, it was so funny to meet a German that had been he says, you were lucky. He says, I was trapped in that tunnel. He says, took me a couple days to dig my way out. <laughs> so anyways, get back to my story anyway. Mm. Yeah, they, they, they'd give me one of, uh, we had fired 21 rounds at an empty pillbox for practice with the mortar, uh, with the uh, bazooka, and only one went off. So nobody wanted to carry a bazooka after that, because the ammunition had been sabotaged. But he said he sent all the bad ammunition back and got all new ammunition, but nobody believed him. <laughs> Oh, and while I was guarding that window, uh, one of the patrols that was walking under the window, one of the fellows sneezed, and the other Germans were cursing them out for making noise. But all the first floor windows had log, uh, logs cover them, so Chapel couldn't come in. Now, after I threw those two grenades out, uh, everybody started calling me grenade for throwing grenades. <laughs> oh, yeah, and uh, the first lieutenant, after we were there about three days, he decided to shave. And he, he shaved, and he just got all cleaned up when a shell hit the roof of our building and he was covered with soot and we were all laughing at him for being black. But uh, Gordon C. Albertson had a close call. He was asking me for a match uh, for a match to light a cigarette and I told him I couldn't leave my post. I said, I'll meet you halfway in the hall give you a match and as he walked out that's when the shell hit right over the window he was standing and he'd have been killed if he was there so he always said I saved his life by making him come away from the window for a minute and he said he told me the cigarette saved his life and he would never quit smoking and th that same shell he, it, uh, blown 
soot out of the out of the stove. Oh, there was an outhouse just outside. One of the fellows had to go, so we ran out in the outhouse. As soon as he get in the outhouse, he started getting mortars landed around it. They had seen him go in it. So he come running in with his pants half up. <laughs> and so the last night we were in this house, I had an air burst outside my window, which knocked me out. I must have been out for a while because when the fellow in the room next to, me, to mine came into my room, I was on the floor. He said after the shell explosion, he had been trying to get me to answer him for 15 minutes. He came into my room just as I was coming around. March 9th, we got good news. We were being relieved. The Air Force was going to start bombing the mine at 11 o'clock and keep it up until 12 noon so we could pull back safely. The Germans shot down that first plane, but the bomb he, he dropped took down both towers. And when the last plane had made its last round, the next group of planes come over and took over, never lost the interval. They really had their timing down pat. But when they started bombing, we were able to get up and just walk out of there, which we couldn't do before. That's because they had the tunnels all sealed. <coughs> well, yeah, and when we got back to the half-tracks, T-5 John R. Higgins greeted us with a smile, a new half-track, and a bottle of wine for each of us. We were all glad to be going back to Longville for a short rest, which would be the last one for a lot of the men until VE Day, May 8th. In Colson, I must mention, we lost Russell Scott, who was wounded real bad uh, by 14 pieces of shrapnel at a crossroads. He was sent back to the States. Our new man bought, so we never heard from him again. He, well, it was uh, combat fatigue, uh, shell shock. We, we never heard from him again. Matt. March 14th, we were back in Longville for maintenance and rehabilitation. When we were being shelled in four back, I was knocked down twice. I failed to notice that my gas mask bag had a big hole in the bottom of it. A piece of shrapnel had cut a long rip in the bag, and I last all, lost all my spear, socks, candy, and tobacco. Did not notice this until I went to change my wet socks and check the right foot that had been had a, a quarter inch cut in the shoe. My sock had a quarter inch cut but my foot wasn't cut. I had to wear the same wet socks all the time we were in four back and I get trench foot real bad. I threw this gas bag away like the dented bullets as they were no good. When we got back to Longville, I had a bad case of trench foot, and I started having eye problems. Don't know if it was caused by the shell shock, uh, because while we held out the five houses out of 15, we couldn't sleep for three days and nights, and we all had a window to guard and keep the Germans at bay. I reported to sick bay March 15th for treatment of my trench foot. Mentioned the medic, mentioned to the medic of my eye trouble, and he put my feet in some purple liquid for an hour. Then sent me to 82nd Medical Battalion, 
Hospital where I went by ambulance to medical hospital in Dijon, France, for treatment of my eyes. This was a U.S. Army General Hospital in Dijon, France, where I arrived on the 16th for treatment of my eyes and a wound to the third finger of my right hand, just a neck which a bandage took care of. A nurse dressed my finger and wanted to give me a purple hat for it. I told her it was only a neck, and I didn't want to worry my parents, thinking I had been hit bad. So I turned the purple hat down. When I arrived at the hospital, they took my P-38 pistol away from me, and I never got it back. They said they, they had it. I refused to let them take my boy knife, so the doctor let me keep it under my pillow. <coughs> the doc ex examined my eyes. I was told him that I had been knocked out by a shell for 15 minutes the last day we were in Forbeck, 9th of March, 1945, and had been seeing black and s black spots off and on the last seven days. He put drops in my eyes and told me I would be blind for a few days, not to worry as it would be temporary. If my eyes did not get better, in a few days, he was going to send me back to the States. After seven days of eye rest, the doc said I was okay for combat again, as they needed machine gunners bad. The nurses and doctors in the hospital were wonderful. All the wounded men were great. I never heard any moaning or groaning or complaining. During the nine days I was in there, the second day I was in the hospital, I asked the Red Cross if they would locate my mother's sisters. They lived near Paris, and my mother had not heard from them since the beginning of the war. Later, when I got home, I found out that the Red Cross located them fast and got word home to my parents that they were all safe. Later, one of my aunts and cousins hitchhiked a hundred miles to come and see me in the hospital, but I had left for the front two days before they got there. I buddied up with a ranger in the bed next to mine. He told me he had a glass eye. He lost his eye when he peeked around a corner of a building and a piece of shrapnel hit him in the eye. They did such a good job on his eye that he used to laugh at me because I couldn't tell which was the bad eye. The day before we, we were to go back to the outfits, a French girl took us, took 12 of us on a tour of Dijon. We went in a bus to a high building. She said if we got separated to meet here at a bus at 5 p.m. We all climbed to the top of the building and were looking the over the city, where my ranger buddy pointed to a bar at the bottom of the building. Needless to say, the two of us sneaked away from the rest and spent our day in the tavern. To our surprise, the bartender refused to take our money all day. At five o'clock, we thanked him and went back to the bus. We were greeted by the French girl guide with the remarks of, where have you naughty boys been all day? We looked all over for you. Okay. everything else, even went overseas together. We sat in the train going through France together and were separated at the replacement of the depot. Uh, Al Duncan had got off the train to go get us some wine and missed the train. When he came back, we were 
just going down the track. So he got in another train that tried to catch us and never did catch us. And we went through the town twice. It just made a circle. It was a German plane trying to get us. If he'd stayed where he was, he could have got, the, got us when we made the second trip around. But, so we never saw him again until after the war was over. But both of the Al's made it home okay, and I saw him afterwards. Uh, Al went to an infantry company. He told me he had been hit in the right leg by a machine gun bullet. He showed me the stitches. It was about six inches below the hip. He said he laid in the field until dark and crawled back. The hospital was well organized. They seemed to have placed everyone where the next person to you was in worse shape than you. One fellow I talked to said his father told him he had a hard head. He laughed and said his father was right. He had been hit by shrapnel in the forehead right between the eyes. He had a two-inch round uh, gash two inches above the bridge of his nose. He had two of the most swollen black eyes I ever saw. Another fellow I spoke to got hit in the back of the helmet by a bullet. It went from the back of the helmet liner and his scalp to the front and then down so he had 14 stitches on his scalp and two on the tip of his nose. The day I was leaving, I took a walk into the hospital ward. I will never forget the courage these fellows had. The nurses had the beds set up so that as you entered the ward, the first person you spoke to had only one limb missing. But as you walked further, they had two, then three. Each bed uh, got worse. I stopped to talk to each person, and each time I got the same reply. Oh, I am okay. The next fellow on my right is worse. I went this way all the way down to the next to last bed. The fellow... Uh, continue. The fellow lost both legs and both arms and one eye. When I talked to him, he said he was lucky. He could see the movies on the ceiling. He said the fellow next to him in the baby basket, which was the last in line, could not even talk. With that, I made a very quick exit, but I will never forget the brave front these men showed. My head had to go off for these courageous men. With that thought in mind, I went back to the front. They took a bunch of us by truck from the hospital to join uh, units. On the road, we had a fighter plane dive down on us. Being on the end seat, I had my rifle pointed on him all the way down. But as it, it had American markings on it, I did not want to shoot at it. Lucky for us, our driver took a sharp right turn at the last minute, and the plane missed us. I think it was a captured American plane flown by a German. Later I found out that same day an American plane strafed one of our tanks loaded with 12 armored men riding on the top of it. Uh, Duncan was hit in the stomach by a 50 caliber bullet and died. I'm almost sure this was the same plane that dived on us. Today I am sorry I didn't shoot at it. It was so close I could not have missed it, and I had armor-piercing bullets in my rifle. That night the truck dropped us off in a field with a hundred other men waiting to join their outfits. This field was on a road that ran parallel to the Autobahn. First thing I did next day was to dig a big hole and put rail tiles over it with dirt for the roof covering. It had an L-shaped trench leading into it. Uh, but that day I had walked back to see the knocked out tanks and there was a, a German knocked out tank every, well, I'd say, 500 yards. They were spaced. And the four of us, we kept looking at all the tanks. And then the guys wanted to go back 
And I says, well, there's one more tank. I want to go see that. It's a tiger. So they says, well, we don't have a weapon. I says, well, here, take my rifle. There's three of you and only one of me. So I says, you take my rifle and ammunition. I says, I got my knife. I says, I want to see the last one. So I walked back to the last tank and told them, give me my rifle back when they get back. So they took off and I took off and I went to the last tank and there was a uh, bazooka, a German bazooka. And I picked it up and I was going to fire it at one of the knocked out tanks. And I said, I better not. I don't know, you know, just how bad it was. It's a good thing I didn't because they really, when they go off, they blow everything around it. So I put it back down the ground. They started to walk away and this German jumped out of the bush with a machine gun. It was just getting dark, so you could just make out the motions. So I don't know if he was going to surrender or what, but he had a weapon. But when he jumped out of the woods, well, I reached back and I grabbed my knife. Uh, he must have thought I was reaching for a forty-five because he went back in the woods and I went the other side and I ran one straight line through that woods. I didn't see a tree or anything till I got about a hundred yards down. Then I get back on the road and get back to my outfit. And they gave me my rifle back, but the uh, MPs that were there, they says, "What are you doing, wandering around without a rifle?" I says, "Well, I gave it to them. There's three of them and only one of me." So I figured it was, if somebody something happened, it was only going to lose one guy, not three. So, but we get back, and then I get. Uh, let's see where I pick up. Oh, I, I'm sorry I didn't shoot at it. Oh, that was the airplane. Okay, the second night I was in the field, he uh, strafed the light he saw half a mile from us. Uh, it turned out to be a field hospital. He killed a doctor, a nurse, and a German soldier that they were operating on. And at the same time, that there was a, a jeep, and being nighttime, the tr first truck stopped. The jeep crashed into it and killed the guy that was driving the jeep, and the truck behind him hit that. And that was all because they stopped when the plane dove on him. Oh, yeah, it says it was seven tanks, not five tanks. But that's what our outfit had knocked out. They had knocked out seven tanks that day. So, and I had a hole about that big around in the front, and then it would carry through and explode back where the motor was. Let's see, when I got to headquarters, they told me that half of my squad, or half of my platoon had been captured. So I'd missed being captured by a day. I was lucky. But I ended up in headquarters company, and they told me that they wanted me to stay in headquarters so I could identify the bodies. Uh, they wanted to keep me alive. So that's why I'm here today, because I... They said they couldn't find the outfit anyways. They would taken off and they'd cross the Rhine and gone down Danube. Let's see, let's see if I can pick it. They said they were going to keep me alive so I could identify the men in my platoon if the sh Germans shot them. Besides, they didn't know where the rest of the company was. The captain said the battalion got mad and took off on a mad dash through Germany. The second time we moved headquarters to just over the Danube River at the Diligent Bridge. It became the first armored unit to cross the Danube River by force in history. On May 8, the war in Germany ended. Headquarters was now an L wagon. The captain said he would make me a corporal if I would stay in the headquarters and learn to type, but I told him I wanted to return to my old C Company, 66th Infantry Battalion. 
wanted to see my old buddies. C-66 was now billeted in Rosenberg, which was roughly three miles outside of L Wagon. The next day I returned to my old squad and again uh, was given a machine gun. We made raids on towns looking for SS men and Gestapo men. We found a lot of them hiding in civilian clothes. We took over a large factory, factory close by and kept them prisoners for war crimes trials. I was guarding these men when I get orders in July 1945 to report to La Havre, France, to ship back to the U.S. on the ship Sea Poppers. We were to go home for 30 days, leave them report to California to start a new armored division to invade Japan. But uh, back when I was guarding the prisoners, I was on duty at the guard, at the main guard, and at that time they only had one man to each post. And while I was standing there, a, a truck came in loaded with bread. And I noticed this young German fellow, he climbed up the side of the truck, climbed in among the bread, and I, I, I kept my eye on him, watching him, and all of a sudden I see him kind of take something and put it in the back, and then he went to leap out of the truck. And when he leaped out of the truck, he had his back towards me and his shirt went up, and I saw a P-38 tucked in the waistband. So I yelled to him, three times I yelled, and each time I shot, I shot up in the air. And I yelled, Corporal of the Guard, because I couldn't go after him, I couldn't leave my post. And when I yelled, Corporal of the Guard, the lieutenant come running out, and the sergeant come out, and I told him, I says, I can't leave the post, but I says, there's a German that just took a luga out of the loaves of bread. And he's gone into that building down there. I said, I didn't want to kill him because he's inside the plant, and I didn't want to wound him because the war's over. So I said, he's in there somewhere. I says, so they went in and they searched the building, but they couldn't find the pistol. But they had informers in the prison, and they told them that they were planning an escape, and they needed that pistol to help them escape. So what they did is they brought up a tank, and they doubled all the guards, and uh, then the next day they put me inside guarding a lieutenant that was interrogating, you know, peacefully interrogating, just slap him around a little bit, get him to sign the papers that they were Gestapo, because what it was is when we rounded up these prisoners, they had a little mark on the left arm, shoulder, if they had a scar, it meant they had that little blue mark removed, so they needed interrogation, and they had to sign the papers to stand trial at the Nuremberg trials. So <coughs> what I would do is I would open the door, grab one prisoner, bring him in, lieutenant would interrogate him, uh, a little slapping around, punching the nose, break his nose, and then I'd had to take him up to the prison. Now the prison they took, we only had one cell, and that cell had three doors in it, one against the other. The outside door had a two-inch thick oak panel w with a bolt and a key. I'd have to unlock that one, open that up. The next one was a half-inch steel door with just a key. I'd unlock that. And the third one was bars, and I unlocked that. Now inside there we had 21 prisoners in that one little cell. But in the very center was one girl, an SS woman. And she had a good yard all the way around her that nobody could go in and touch. They had to stand outside of that ring. So, but that's what we did. We kept them all in that one cell. And we had one little fellow that was, was only a little bit of a guy, but he was tough. He took an awful beating. And each time I'd have to drag him off and carry him up 
lock him in. The next day I had to bring him down. He wouldn't sign the papers. For three days he wouldn't sign the papers. Finally he signed them. And then uh, I, the other one that stands out in my memory is this great big six foot four uh, fellow I bring in. He took one look at me and one look at the lieutenant. He says, Nix SS Gestapo. He says, ah, you know what's going to happen, huh? He says, yeah, me sign. <laughs> and he signed right off. So, I mean, you read in the papers that we didn't use violence. We did use violence. But uh, we just didn't talk about it that time. Now it's so many years later. Nobody's going to get in trouble. I figure I can tell that story, you know. So, anyways, continue my story. Uh, when I was coming back on the sea poppers, uh, two days out, they dropped the first H-bomb. So one day from the U.S. in New York, they dropped the second bomb. We landed in New York on August 13th at 4 p.m. At 4.30 p.m., Japan surrendered. At 5 o'clock, we unloaded to a great celebration. We were served milk and cookies at the landing. The girls were kissing us. Uh, what a day. They took us to a camp and gave us all a big steak and dinner. Sent us home next day for 30 days leave. While I was home, I got a telegram to extend my leave to 45 days and then to report to the Camp Swift near Austin, Texas, to the 2nd Infantry Division. I was put in a 57 millimeter recoilless rifle squad. They had two of these 57s in my squad. I was a squad leader with the rank of acting sergeant. We practiced marching every day and had weekend passes to Austin every weekend. We had night exercises in the woods. On one, I was leading my squad to the woods at night when I fell off a small cliff and hurt my two knees. Ended up in the hospital. When they left, well, my nef, left knee swelled up like a football. Tried to march in victory parade at Austin, but they took me out of line when I started limping. Took me by ambulance to the hospital where they packed my leg in ice for a week. After they shipped us by train uh, to do victory parades in New York City, then to San Francisco, California. This was our last victory parade. They shipped us to Fort Lewis, Washington. While there, they had a jailbreak in Alcatraz. I was told to get my squad in a waiting truck. They had our 57 recoilless rifle and ammo uh, ready in the truck, but to bring our rifles. When we get in the truck, the motor was already running. They gave us ammo for our rifles and said the squad had been chosen to go in through a hole we were to shoot with the 57 recoilless rifles and then we were to charge the convicts. Just as we were going to go to the first sergeant, came running out and said the auto was canceled. And they had told us that they had captured the ammunition uh, part of the prison. And as it turned out, they only had one pistol. All right, that, that tells you how the rumors get started. Uh, they said the Marines were going to do the job instead of us. But we all cheered when they said the Marines were going to do it. We had been told that the convicts had got into the armory and had all sorts of weapons. The next day, the paper said the Marines fired one bazooka round and the convicts waved a white flag, uh, and they surrendered the white, the, they threw out the pistol. So much for false information. A few weeks later, 28th of June, 1946, I was honorably discharged, thus ended my Army service, earning the Combat Infantry Badge, Bronze Star, Victory Medal, American Theater Service, Medal, Army of Occupation Medal, Germany, European, Africa, Middle Eastern Service Medal, Good Conduct Medal, 
two battle stars, Rhineland and Central Europe, two French medals, De La Gaulle in 1939-1945, the victory de Colmar. These two French medals were only authorized to wear under the U.S. medals in August 30th, 1953. This concludes my story. And what a story it was. Okay. I want to thank you and, for and sitting you with me. Keep us. Fantastic. I had lived a few times. That's and, great. But it was better when I read it <laughs> than the ad lib and pop. Wow. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit with me. Okay. Uh, long time coming and glad that we could do it. Okay. I got to get up in a hurry. I'm supposed to go out for a, a meeting with my daughter.